I seek refuge in God from Satan the accursed. In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful. May God grant us all patience over the martyrdom of Hussein, peace be upon him. And may God include us among those who will avenge his blood alongside the Holy Savior, the Imam al-Mahdi. May God's peace and blessings be upon him. I send my condolences over the heartbreaking tragedy and the history of humankind that is the Ashura tragedy. I send my condolences to the Holy and Promised Savior the God's greatest authority on the earth, Imam al-Mahdi. May God hasten his advent. And I hope that the Almighty God hasten his reappearance. Because by his reappearance, all afflictions of humankind come to an end. I also send my condolences to all the believing men and women, to all the oppressed nations, to all the nations who face injustice, either economically, politically, domestically, or what have you. I send my condolences to all and everyone. In one of these ziyarats of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, the following lines are mentioned. The pilgrims recite this line to Imam Hussein, peace be upon him. You were a son of the God's holy messenger and approve to the Holy Quran. Oh, the Master of the Martyrs, you were a son of the God's Holy Messenger and approve and support to the Holy Book of God, the Quran. Imam Hussein had this responsibility to implement Quran's orders and commands. The Islam that was practiced at that time was dead. And Imam Hussein wanted to revive it. The Umayyads, beginning with Abu Sufyan and continuing with Muawiyah, Yazid, and others, and also their successors, the Abbasid rulers, they all pursued two agendas. And this is understood by their numerous actions and words. 
First, they wanted to uproot Islam and destroy the Holy Quran. Just to mention one of the countless things they did, after the conquest of Mecca, Abu Sufyan said this to Abbas, the Prophet's uncle, that your nephew has become quite a king. Abbas replied, be quiet, this is the prophethood. This is the mission of the Almighty God. Later on, Abu Sufyan, during the time of Uthman, visited the grave of Hamza, the master of the martyrs. Before the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, Hamza was called the master of the martyrs. So Abu Sufyan visited the grave of Hamza and disrespected this grave. And he said, I wish you were alive and you could see that the Islam for which you made sacrifices has now been fallen into the hands of the Banu Umayyah. It is also said in history that Muawiyah explicitly vowed that he would not stop working until he deletes the name of the God's Messenger and the call to prayers in the Adan. After the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, Yazid repeated the same nonsense, saying that Islam was just an excuse for having power. He denied all revelations and the faith in its entirety. They wanted Islam gone, but also they wanted to destroy the Holy Ahl Bayt. On the day of Ashura, one of them said that everyone should be killed, making sure that not even a young kid is alive from this family. They followed these two agendas. So the first goal was to uproot the genuine Islam. which was implemented by the Prophet's words and actions. And after the Holy Prophet, only Imam Ali, peace be upon him, during his time of leadership, did the same as the Holy Prophet. But to a great extent, the real Islam was destroyed. Fasting, prayers, Hajj, and other acts of worship, which are really important parts of Islam, they all were being practiced at the time of Yazid and Muawiyah even during the time of the Abbasid rulers. All these acts of worship 
are only one part of the Islamic law. Anyone can pick up a copy of the Risala, which is a handbook of the Islamic law, or they can read the Sharia of Islam, which is a bigger source of Islamic law, or even you could also read the Jawahir al-Kalam, fasting, prayers and Hajj are only a small portion of the Islamic law. There are three chapters including the purity subject. They all don't make up 10% of the Islamic law. The seminarians usually read Sharia, which consists of several books on Islamic law, books on transactions, hudud, qisas, and other rulings of Islam. Besides, there are many other principles in the Islamic law that need to be taken into account, but they are nowhere to be found in any Islamic country. They are not mentioned in any Islamic country at all. Now, I would like to give you one out of the hundreds of examples. It is obligatory to say these things and also to preach these things. And everyone is bound by this responsibility to do whatever they can using their talents and skills and also their facilities. You can use the cell phones you have to spread this message. The Holy Prophet made this statement several times and he practiced it in his own time. And if this statement, which is accredited by all scholars from the Sunni and Shia sects of Islam, you can find the narrations in the book Kafi, Bihar al-Anwar, and other books of an, an Islamic law. If this single statement was implemented today in the Islamic countries, we would not have any poor people whatsoever. No one would ever have any problem with housing. No one would have faced financial problems when getting married. Everyone could afford all medical treatments they needed. No one would have taken their lives because of the financial issues. We would have no homicides for money. The educated people can study this statement in depth. And here is the statement. Firstly, I would like to mention this, that the first people who fought the Holy Prophet of Islam since the very day of the onset of Islam, they were the pagans. The Holy Quran and traditions have said it wasn't the Jews. On the other hand, the Jews had it in their books that there will be a prophet in Yathrib, today's Medina,
So they traveled from all across the world to Yathrib, to Medina, and they lived there. Because they wanted to join the Promised Prophet, Quran then says, when the Jews learned that the Prophet is not from their own tribe, they decided to revolt against the Prophet. However, pagans were the first people to fight Islam. In spite of this, when the Quran mentions the enemies of Islam, it makes it clear that the Jews were more inimical of Islam. The Quran also changes the order, naming the Jews first. It is because that the Jews work 24-7 against the holy religion of Islam. They provoke hypocrites to assassinate the Holy Prophet and also to overthrow the Islamic government. They provoked the pagans to begin wars against Muslims. But after all these wars, which are imposed on Muslims by the Jews, at the time when the Jews were filled with hatred towards the Holy Prophet, their strongholds were conquered by Imam Ali and Muslims. After all of these incidents, the Holy Prophet made three statements. It happened after the conquest of Mecca. The Prophet made these statements, and all Muslims unanimously have recorded it. It is also narrated by Imam Salat peace be upon him in the famous book Kafi. Many books on Islamic law have also mentioned this. The Prophet made three statements. Anyone living under the rule of the Islamic government if he dies, all his properties go to his inheritors. In other words, the Holy Prophet levied no taxation on the inheritance. Should one die and leave an inheritance, it all belongs to the inheritors. The Prophet also said, Should one die and leave behind a debt, it is all on me. It means that if someone died, while he was in debt, and if he doesn't have enough money to pay off the debt, the Prophet said that the inheritors don't have to pay off this debt. The 
if a person dies and doesn't have enough money to pay off his debts, the creditors should refer to the Holy Prophet himself. The Prophet then said, if a person dies and leaves behind a family that needs support, the Prophet said that he will support and provide for this family. The Holy Prophet implemented these laws during his lifetime. No taxation on inheritance. Pagans used to levy taxes on inheritance. And the Prophet put an end to it. If a person died in debt, the creditors didn't need to go after his family, <laughs> even if the family was well off. <coughs> These are parts of the Islamic law. <coughs> Islamic law is just not about fasting, prayers, and hajj. So a person dies in debt, he doesn't have enough money. And now if his family are billionaires, the Prophet said that he is made responsible by the Almighty God. He, as the leader of the Muslims, is made responsible by God Almighty to pay off all these kinds of debts. Nowhere in the Islamic countries this law is implemented. Is it not a part of the Islamic law? This is the Islamic economy. This single tradition from the Holy Prophet of Islam, which is narrated by all groups of Muslims, and this is a historical fact, and the Quran instructs us to follow the Prophet's footsteps. Indeed, the Prophet is a great role model for all of you. So the Islamic leaders should learn this from the Holy Prophet. The Jews who were so inimical of the Holy Prophet of Islam but when the Holy Prophet made these statements, which was at a time 22 years after the onset of the Holy Religion of Islam, and it was almost one year before the Prophet's martyrdom, you can find these traditions in the book Kafi that Imam Sadr said that after these three statements by the Holy Prophet of Islam, it was enough reason for the majority of the Jews to convert to Islam. Those Jews who are so hostile to the Holy Prophet of Islam, the majority of them 
had a change of heart and they became Muslims. The Jews were after money and it was enough for them. These three laws guaranteed their financial success. No taxes were levied on their inheritance money. And even if they died in debt, the Prophet had vowed to pay off those debts. And even if they had left behind a poor family who needed to be supported, the Holy Prophet promised to provide for them and he did what he said. Those Jews who are called the worst enemies of the believers by the Holy Quran, as mentioned by Imam Sadiq, peace be upon him, the majority of the Jews became Muslims. Now, even if, if an Islamic leader follows the footsteps of the Holy Prophet of Islam today and announces that these three statements, the economy will be immune. All countries, particularly the Muslim countries, have severe economic problems. Why is that? We should know that. There is nothing wrong with the Islamic economics. The poor people can easily take loans from the rich because all people like to help out one another and they don't fear if the poor person dies and doesn't pay off the debt because they know that the Islamic leader will pay off the debt instead. And as a result, it would be much easier to give loans to people. These interesting things about Islam are unknown to many Muslims themselves. You can read the book Kafi that after this tradition from Imam Sadat, peace be upon him, there is another tradition again from Imam Sadat, peace be upon him, in which he said that these laws do not only apply to the Holy Prophet of Islam. Some might say that it was only the Prophet's responsibility. If Imam Sadiq had not said this, the Quran had also said that it is not just the Prophet's responsibility. Everything the Holy Prophet does and says applies to all Muslims. However, Imam Sadiq said that after the Prophet, the leader of the Muslims, the one who has control and authority, over the Muslims' treasury, if he doesn't pay off these debts, the sins should burden this leader. You can find the tradition in the book Kafi. The poor economy in Muslim countries is not because of Islam. The dear youth should notice this fact. We need to let the world of non-Muslims know that Islam is flawless. However, the Umayyad in their mission to destroy the religion of Islam, especially the economic and political policies of Islam, were quite successful.
سودی ها اینا نمیاد پایین If we manage to improve the Muslims economy using these three statements, if the leaders of the Muslim countries make this happen, the number of suicides decline, homicides become less, kidnappings decrease, because they all go back to economy. The violence and mental issues will be gone. To a large extent, economy is the main issue in the Muslim countries. And we can solve our economic issues using these three statements. No one would need loans, and if he does, everyone readily gives him a loan. You want to buy a house, you can easily take loans from the rich people. مرد زن و بچهش چی ندارن تا بود کار میکرد زن و بچهش اداره میکرد حالا ندارن Of course there should be a document signed between the two parties به حبس میفتن سرفتی درر دایید همین یه دونه رو جوانه The Islamic government can pay off the debt تبلیغ کنن به دنیا به دنیای غیر اسلامی بگن اسلام ما اینه اگه شما کشورهای غیر اسلامی هم گرفتار هستید People can easily take loans for anything they need. Now if someone died and left nothing for his family, the family will not have to commit robbery or any other crime. The dear and brave youths should introduce these statements to the world because this is the real Islam. Even the Western countries can improve their economies by learning from the Holy Prophet of Islam. And there are hundreds and hundreds of such examples. Unfortunately, the Umayyads were quite successful to derail Islam. And it was their goal to destroy Islam. Abu Sufyan, Muawiyah and Yazid followed this agenda. And you can see the result in the Muslim countries today. However, their second agenda that was to destroy Imam Hussein's memory, they failed miserably. It was partly because of the Prophet's prophecy and of course the actions by the good believers and the followers of the Holy Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. And there are also shortcomings which mostly come from the governments. انجام شد نبود بنی امیه همه چیز از بین برده بودن امروز اسمی از پیغمبر اسلام نبود مثل خیلی پیغمبر ها که اسمی نمونده داشت The sacred rituals of Imam Hussein kept the Imam's memory alive The Prophet of Islam said I am from Hussein What does it mean really? The grandfather says that he is from his 
grandson. It means that if it wasn't for the Ashura tragedies, if it wasn't for the sacrifice of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, the Umayyad had destroyed everything. And today, no one would have ever heard the Prophet's name. Like many other Prophets, when Imam Hussein was five years of age, the Holy Prophet of Islam said that Imam Hussein will be killed. And that the adherents of falsehood will struggle, those who are familiar with the Arabic literature, they can see the emphasis in the tone and the language of the Holy Prophet of Islam. That the adherents of falsehood struggle hard to bury Imam Hussein's memory. But as the Holy Prophet said, not only they won't be successful, whatever they do, it results in more glory for Imam Hussein. I myself have seen five different regimes come and go in Iraq, one worse than the other, particularly in dealing with the Husseini rituals. They fought against these rituals, they put people in prison and tortured them. But today, you see the glory of these rituals in Iraq. This year alone, many laws were put in place to restrict these rituals. But as you saw today, Floods of people took part in the rituals in the morning of Ashura in the holy city of Karbala. The same happened in Najaf, Kadami, and Samara, and also Baghdad, and even in other countries, and also in the villages and in the cities in the southern and northern parts of Iraq. It was declared that the Tawiraj ritual will not happen this year. And the Iraqi borders were all closed this year. Only a few people could travel to Iraq for these rituals. But well done to the Iraqis because they made up for all of these things. It is the prophecy of the Holy Prophet of Islam that it only adds to the glory of Imam Hussein. The Umayyads failed miserably. Sheikh Muhammad Jawad Balaghi is a famous Shia scholar. He wrote two books by which thousands of cultured Christians and Jews converted to Shia Islam. Al-Ruhlatul Madrasiya and Al-Huda. These books are in Arabic and they are being translated to other languages as well. He was a teacher of my father in the city of Samara, 
and he was also a student of Mirza Shirazi, the leader of the tobacco protest. He has other books as well. In one of the books, which was reprinted recently, he said these things about the great Mirza Shirazi. That when Mirza Shirazi traveled to Samara, the great Mirza purchased three houses. One of the houses became a seminary for the students, another was turned into Husseiniya, and the last one became his residence. In the 10-day morning of Ashura, the mourners used to start their processions from the Husseiniya. This place was still intact last time I was in Iraq. The seminary was exploded by Saddam's agents, but I have heard that it was rebuilt again. And the house of Mirza is still also, uh, in the city. The morning rituals on the day of Ashura, the religious students started the procession from the Islamic seminary. But on the morning of the day of Ashura, according to Sheikh Muhammad al Balaghi, it was customary for the great Mirza Shirazi to start the procession of mornings from his own house. And Mirza himself paid for the shrouds that the mourners put on. And then the Shia were a very small minority in Samara. Why did Mirza start off the march of mourners from his own house? Maybe because he wanted no one to stop this. Otherwise, he could have the rituals be held in the Husseiniya. Mourners used to march to the al Askari shrine in Samara. And it is said that this march is still done the same way even today in Samara. The Umayyads were not successful to bury the rituals of Imam Hussein. But this is still not enough. Sheikh Muhammad Hussein Kashif al Ghita, he died 60 years ago. I had seen him many times, both in Najaf and Karbala. In one of his books, which was published recently in the Holy City of Qom, this great scholar writes, that he was once approached by a Christian bishop who said that the Shia people do not know how to introduce Imam Hussein. The scholar, the Christian scholar then said that if Hussein was a Christian figure, they would have raised banners of mourning in all parts of the world and called people to their faith by the name of Hussein. Today, Imam Hussein's name is everywhere, but that's not enough. You should do whatever you can to promote the rituals of Imam Hussein. You can also encourage others through your cell phones to do the same, both in Muslim and in non-Muslim countries. 
you can connect to your friends and family and encourage them to promote these rituals. There are many chapels in the world, but not too many Husseiniyas. Every one of us is responsible. Are there Husseiniyas in all cities of the Muslim countries? Are there Husseiniyas in all the cities of the non-Muslim countries? We all need to carry out our responsibilities. We should promote these rituals by money, words, or any other way possible. Here I would like to thank all those people who upheld the Ashura rituals in their homes and in other places in this year and in all parts of the world. All those people who contributed in any way possible to the Husseini rituals. Anything that is considered a veneration of Imam Hussein is sacred. You also can introduce Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, on the social media. Or you can raise funds and set up centers to promote the culture of Ashura. We need thousands of centers to promote Imam Hussein's sacrifice. At the moment, there are thousands of centers to spread corruption. And it is really sad to see that they are impacting the Muslim youngsters in the Muslim countries. The youths need to be enlightened. It is the responsibility of everyone. And every word counts in this path. All oceans are made of drops of water. There are hundreds of millions of lovers of the Holy Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. They all need to buckle up and promote the rituals of Imam Hussein. All the naysayers in the last 50 years, whatever they did led to more glory of these rituals. I thank everyone, particularly the brave Iraqi people, who mourned Imam Hussein's martyrdom all across Iraq this year. In southern Iraq and in some villages in the north, particularly the Tuviraj ritual, which hosted countless number of people this year. And I consider this my obligation, my religious obligation, to pray for all of them. You can see this in the Kamla Ziyarat, that the Holy Infallibles did the same. And you know, the actions of the Holy Infallibles, they are proof of responsibility, obligatory or recommended. So it is my responsibility to pray for all these people. Now, I would like to address all people who can hear my voice. To start working and promote the Arbain pilgrimage this year. 
کسایی پول جمع میکنن یه ماشین دو ماشین ده ماشین بیست ماشین برای کسایی که پول ندارن There should be airliners to send people to Iraq for free. حکومت عراق، حکومت‌های جوار اینا هم کمک کنن، سنگ سخت گیری نکنن. I do not expect governments to do that because they do the opposite. پول نگیرن. آخه یعنی چه پول گرفتن واسه رفتن به زیارت امام حسین؟ یعنی چی؟ The will to do people should pay for the airliners during the Arbain pilgrimage. I know that they have hired and rented many cars. for the transportation of the pilgrims during the Arbain. And this happens in many countries like in Iran and in the Gulf countries. The Iraqi government and its neighbors should also help out. They should not be very strict with the visa rules. It is really absurd to ch charge people with money in the Arbain pilgrimage. This is what Yazid would have done. because this stops many people from joining this pilgrimage. And this is assisting Yazid. The infallibles have said that some people who call themselves Shia they are worse than the polytheists and pagans. Why? Who are they? This world is a place of trials. How can they look at Imam Hussein in the eye in the afterlife? And as you know, people will encounter Imam Hussein before the Judgment Day. How can they answer to the angels on the night after their death? Is it really right to make people pay for Imam Hussein's pilgrimage? I tell this to the brave and concerned dear youths in the non-Muslim countries. That they should convince and put pressure on the governments in these countries so that they don't charge pilgrims with any money. Although Imam Hussein was killed, but Karbala cannot be killed. The Prophet said, nothing but glory reaches it. It is so wrong to charge people with any fees for visa and passport. 30 or 40 years ago, I read this in a famous Arab journal. There is this huge assembly of non-believers once a year. During that event, airliners reduce their fees. All means of transportation become cheaper. Even the hotels reduce their prices. Even the gift shops reduce their prices. Even if a person in a non-Muslim country was under a travel ban because of having a debt, he or she can present a bail and according to the law, They are set free to leave the country and join this annual event. Even the prisoners can plea for taking part in this event. And the non-Muslim governments are mandated by the law to release them in exchange for a bail, so that they can participate in the event. This is what non-believers do to protect their rituals. Why shouldn't we do the same for Husseini rituals? 
It is possible if we all of us, all young people in Western countries, put enough pressure on governments and request for these facilitations. There are many non-Muslims who respect Imam Hussein. The entire world respects Imam Hussein. We all have seen Christians, Jews, and even the atheists and non-believers visit the shrine of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him. They participate in the rituals of Imam Hussein. All in all, we need to double our efforts to promote the Arbain pilgrimage in this year so that we can realize the prophecy by the Holy Prophet of Islam. I hope that by the grace of the Holy Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, God Almighty grants this honor to everyone. May God bless Muhammad and his pure household.